sing the Lord's prayer, praise us God in heaven. We praise you, we honor you, we glorify your name. We come to the throne of grace with our full of gratitude and thanksgiving as we be able to bring our Sabbath school, may your presence go with each one of us. May our mighty hands and strong us speaking to each one so that we might be able to accept it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I want to welcome Pastor Chal as I already in the video. And we're very pleased that you be able to be with us. Our online viewers, I want to welcome you too as we participate in the Sabbath School lesson. And before we get into the Sabbath School lesson, and uh, our mission report is taken and is entitled as Adapted at a Funeral. If you are having your Sabbath School lesson, please turn with me to page 43 and you can be able to follow. Uh, what we are going through of our uh, mission report. And it's quite very much interesting that uh, in mission report that, that we have this uh, week. And I hope that we'll be able to follow with just a second now. Okay, adapted at a funeral. Mourners gathered for the funeral of the young mother of the Seventh day Adventist Church in Milan. Our town, just two miles or three kilometers from Musambi border with Malawi. The woman had died of HIV complications just uh, five days after giving the birth to a baby boy. Her HIV positive husband, the boy's father, had died earlier. The wee baby bawled during the funeral. He was crying because there was no one to nurse him, said Clement. Matthew's mother, a 61 years old father who attended the funeral. He was crying because there was no one to nurse him. Clementine spoke with a famous relative of the funeral and learned that they had little money for milk and diapers. He considered buying the items, but worried about the relatives might resell them, so he offered to adopt the baby. The boy, Lady Blackson, is now five and the youngest of four orphans adopted by Clement and his wife. They also have four more biological children too. Clement, who grows. Green beans and maize on the farm in rural western Sunday is a Catholic church member and lay evangelist who has led 430 people to baptism for the past 30 years. Is that right? But nothing has touched his heart like as adopted four children who lost their parents out of HIV AIDS. My goodness. God has blessed me with the gift of bringing people to him. But real happiness comes in caring for this orphan society. The adults that I lead to Christ are able to take care of the physical needs, but the orphans would suffer twice without me. Their physical needs wouldn't be met, and they might lose salvation. HIV AIDS is a major challenge in Mozambique, and Clement is among such an effort is trying to make a difference. He adopted the first orphan, Rogero, of the same, the two years old, is scavenging for food at the roadside. Relatives told him that Rogero's parents are dying and gladly handed over him when he offered to raise the boy. Climate up to the two children, both girls in a similar way. Rogero is now 15, and the two girls are permanent. The last, the least, that I can do is take a few children and feed them in my home, Clement said. Clement belongs to a school where the adapted children can study in the land. We as a church are supposed to invest in education, to invest in the future of our church. He said, don't you think so, it's a heart for me. Don't you think so, it's a heart dashing. The life of humanity is not to live for ourselves. It is to live even for the people who are in need. And I like the statement of Jesus very beautifully. He says, I've come here to seek and save the lost. The lost are the people who are hungry. The lost are the people who are thirsty. The lost are the people who are hungry and thirsty for the word of God. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility to feed physically and spiritually and those who are in need. And the right is absolutely very clearly possible when I come to sing it and people said, I have healed, I have done this, I have done this in your name. And the Lord says, I don't know who you are. I mean, like what does the Bible say? When I was sick, you were not there with me. When I was prison, you never visited me. When I was hungry, you never fed me. When I was in need, you never gave me. And the people will start asking, when did you see you, Lord, hungry and thirsty and you are in need but in prison? My God, it's a responsibility. In one of the little way that we can be able to, we should be able to help people. 
Pak Oke, and we are in the second month of the new year. Right? And uh, seven C. How many of you go through your subscription lessons every week? You go through? Okay, it's nice that we be able to go through. Okay, it will be quite good. And uh, we are in lesson five, the fifth week, and it's entitled as the seven seals. When I remember seven is a complete number, when I remember the seal, you know what does it denote? You have any idea what does the C in biblical term denotes? You have any idea? Which C are you referring to? Okay, uh, the biblical C in reference from, from, yeah, from Revelation chapter 6. The C was like God C. Okay, yeah, you're right, absolutely. Okay, one C is called as a God C, that is the Sabbath, that's a mark of creation. Okay, that's a beautiful. There is another C which is absolutely recorded in Revelation chapter 6. And it's quite very interesting. Okay, the Gospel of Revelation 6 is entirely different from the four Gospels and other Gospels that we have in the Word of God. And we are going to get into that a little more. And we were then in this text last week too, which is recorded in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. And you see the whole heaven is being seated, and the Lord of heaven is able to enter. The books were opened, and the 24 elders and everyone, the little creatures, are praising God's name. Okay, and the majesty, the glory of the Lord enters into the most holy place, and that's what we will be able to believe. And there was a sanctuary, and the whole earth, I'm sorry, the whole celestial beings, eyes are there on this land which take the existence of the world. And there goes the next year. It says, you are worthy to take the scroll. What was there in the scroll? The seal. The seal. Was there something? We are going to open it. Okay? And to open in the seals, you see, everything is self explanatory. It says, you are worthy to take the scroll. What was there in the scroll? It says, and to open its seals. So, it is a plural form. It is not one. It is not more is more than one. That's what I'm going to say. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. And that's what Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 and 10 says. Did you understand anything in this? Can get something out of it? Okay. Revelation chapter 6 uh, continues, is a continuation of Revelation chapter 4. Why do I say this? It's only because in these two okay, verses that we get, the two chapters will be able to see Christ has been exalted and he's been claimed to be worthy of taking up the scrub or opening the sea. And then Christ is the one who was victorious over death, that's what it means to say. And since he was been able to be victorious over death, and there was no option that he had an opportunity to sit at the right hand of the Father, right? Since he was obedient to the commands, or he was absolutely, you know, into what the Father's will is all about in his life, and the mission that the God had proposed Okay, in heaven was fulfilled through Jesus. And you and I will be able to find uh, okay, uh, that the Lord in his own infinite mercy from the time of Pentecost. Remember the time of Pentecost, right? Okay, great awakening happened and whole lot of change miraculously. You see the disciples with a whole brim of uh, happiness and joy and a new vigor and vitality of their life to be able to carry out the gospel. And before which it was absolutely not there at all. Even Jesus was there with the disciples. Uh, they were unable to just make it up. You know what And they were unable to be a part of Christ also. Even though they were there with Christ, uh, they never understood him. But only the Pentecost made a difference. Why do you think so? The Pentecost made a difference. What was the thing? 
What was that element which made the difference in the life of the disciples? Holy which was unable to be able to take place when Jesus was there on this earth. Yes, Sister Mary. The sending of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely right. Okay. That's the perfect answer. Okay. The Holy Spirit made a difference in the life of the disciples. So if the Holy Spirit can make a difference in the life of the disciples, so how much more that we have to yarn for the Holy Spirit? And that's one of the reasons the gift of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, and happiness. Whatever comes out of positivity, whatever comes out okay, in our life with adherence is to the Spirit and the Spirit alone. I know one of the Bible says, ask and it shall be given. What is that they are asking? What is that we need then? And the Bible says it very clearly through the Son Jesus Christ that we need to ask of the Spirit which is the greatest gift of each one of our lives. And that's one of the reasons Jesus mentioned it many times. He says, until unless I go, I will never be able to send you a comforter. The other name for the Spirit is comforter. The other name for Spirit is He is the one who leads us into all truths. Leads us to Christ. So Pentecost made an important expansion in the life of uh, the disciples. And then the preaching of the sea is referred to the preaching of the gospel and the consequence of rejecting it. You see, Jesus is there in the most holy place and he has a plan of salvation of each one of our lives and he has won death victoriously and he is awake and he's there sitting at the right hand of Christ. And you see the whole universe eye is upon this only earth. And the Bible says it very clearly, as we read, and the seals were opened, and the judgment begins. And this is an opportunity for every individual. I like this one. I like this one. And he says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people. Why is it mentioned so particularly? Have you ever thought about it? Brother Anand, have you ever thought about why is it mentioned? Twice it is mentioned. Thrice, I'm sorry. Number one, it was mentioned in Matthew chapter 28. He says, Go ye therefore and make disciples to every nation tongue. The second one is referred in Revelation chapter. Okay, six, it is talking about, okay, that every nation, kindred, tongue, people, language. And in Revelation chapter 14, the third time is speaking about the everlasting gospel to every kindred, nation, tongue, people. Why, why do you think so? All this I mentioned. Everyone. If it is if, 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 like, like, like John chapter 3 verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, for whosoever believeth. Simple word. But here, thrice he mentions in the book of Revelation, okay, every nation, kindred, tribe, tribe, and language. Why? Have any idea? You have any idea? No? You know, man has become so selfish. <laughs> he is the one who has created all the tribe and think his tribe is better. His culture is different, is better, his language is better. We all have made our own languages, our own tribe, our own thing, and we have our own gods. Come to India, we you know we have nothing big pros of gods. <laughs> and every god is more powerful than the other. And we have all the gods been fighting for themselves. And here, why does he make that? You see, the gospel. As we preach to every nation, kindred, and tongue, because God is one. There is no other religion, there is one religion that is being a part of Christ. So it's inviting every individual to say, it's your tribe, your nation, your tongue, your language, you, you know, my language, my tribe, my people. And God says, if you think so, there is only one, that is me, come unto me. 
Thus, this the Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, that I will give you rest. There's no other name. That you and I could be saved, yeah, but except the name of Christ. That's what it means to say. There's no discrimination with God. No discrimination between God. He loves us equally. Either it might be a Muslim, Hindu, or Christian, or whoever it might be. He loves you equally. His love is unconditional. And his calling, you are going to be here. That's one reason that you stand. Okay. And let's get into the Sunday's lesson that's called as the opening of the first seal, which is recorded. Okay, all the seals in the Bible are recorded in the book of Revelation, chapter 6. So let's turn our Bibles. Okay, if you have, and let's turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation and just we want to go through okay, some of the very important things of what the seals are all about. Okay, if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Okay, all the scenes have been recorded from 1 to okay, 8, but we will go through a few of them. Number 1, look into the Bible, and it says, Revelation chapter 6 was 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the scenes, so you and I will be able to understand there were seven scenes. In the seven seals, the number one scene, where the Lord opened, said, And I heard as it were the noise of thunder. And he says, One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold, what did he see? What did he see there? In the first scene, a white horse. And he that sat on him at a bow. Imagine, okay, imagine, when the first seal was opened, John saw in the vision a very important thing. And he saw a white horse. And there is a person sitting on a white horse. And he has a bow in his hand. And of course, this person was sitting on the white horse even as a crown. Let's expound a little bit. A crown was given unto him, and he went forth the conquering and to conquer. The beauty of this is analogical. If you and others, I could understand the implication of what this must see was all about, okay? you will be able to be so much thrilled. Okay, white in the biblical terminology represents pureness. White represents righteousness. White represents, okay, a nature of purity. When the first seal was opened, and who was able to open the seal? Someone did it? The lamb that was slain. So it is connecting with Jesus. And it simply says, the white horse. Uh, the person who was sitting on the white horse was none other than the person who is pure, who is righteous. Who is righteous? Who is pure? That's what the book of Revelation talks about, right? None was worthy. That's what we read last time. None was worthy. Who was worthy? Only Christ. Why? Because he was sinless. And he is the one who was victorious over death and sin and Satan. So it simply implicates and let us know that the word the person who was sitting on the horse, but none other than Jesus Christ was pure, was holy, who was righteous. No one. Because he was the only one who was able to open the seat, right? And what he says? And he says, and he went forth, and he said, before going forth, he said, there was a crown. Why crown? Why crown was given to Jesus Christ? Because he was the king of kings. How did he become the king of kings? Because he obeyed to his father. Even unto death. That's what Paul says. You and I have to be obedient till death in order to obtain the crown. And Jesus had the crown because he was obedient. And that's one of the reasons God the Father made him sit at the right hand of God. You see the connection? And then he says, he went forth conquering and to conquer. Was it true? Just imagine after the Pentecost, what happened? When Jesus was there on this earth, did he conquer? And yes, he conquered. How much did he conquer? 
How much did he come for? Everything. How many people are there behind him? Even though there are none, after the Pentecost, even till today, if we have to call the Christian now, how many people are there? Still, people are growing in Christ. Becoming disciples in this Christ. Conquering and conquering and conquering and conquering everywhere. There's no option. So the Lord can conquer. Go to the Old Testament time, you'll be able to find an implicate you. Matter of how the Lord conquered. Either it might be in Egypt, either it might be in Babylon, either it might be in Assyria, either it might be in any part of the place. Okay? Yes, Brother Ram, you have something to share? Uh, maybe you are going into that uh, next point uh, which I wanted to mention. Because ah. It represents the first seal and also the first church because there, there are seven churches that are mentioned in uh, Revelation. Uh -huh. And each church represents a certain message. Yes. And so the first time, uh, the first horse, uh, which is white, represents the first era of Christian Christianity. Yes, absolutely. And Christianity spread very rapidly mm -hmm. uh, from Pentecost. Yes. And of course, there are other seals represented by other horses. Uh, we, you know, the first horse is white, second horse is red, you know, black, you know, black. So I just wanted to mention it. Uh, yeah, I was just about to conclude that part. Okay, okay sure. you mentioned it. Beautiful. Okay. And of course, what, uh, as Brother Art was talking about right now, as uh, every seed has an era, okay, beginning from the resurrection of Christ, that's what we mean. Okay, the first horse, absolutely, uh, of course, you know, what do you mean by horse when you talk about it? Okay, it talks about power. It talks about rapidity, it talks about, you know, you know, the hobby, that's one of the reasons even in our cars we do have the bus park, you know, for a BHP or something. What, what do you call that, Brother Rami? Do you have any idea? You know, a car runs, okay, it has so many horsepower or something to say. Right. Yeah, okay, so it means it, 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 it's something. Okay, uh, let's not go to that part. What do you think is this? Okay, in the seven seals, uh, in the first seal, what we will be able to find is in the first century, how Christianity spread in every angle, how the word of God spread in every angle, where people started to even give themselves without any difficulty to understand, to experience after the Pentecost about what Christ is all about, what was he been able to do that? Okay, and he made an impact in the first century, and even till now, it's for God. That is Okay, quite representative of what the first scene is on. Although Revelation is symbolic, okay, it brings to mind uh, with poor praise Christ as riding in a white horse and leading the heavenly armies and angels to conquer the death. Okay, what is there for Jesus to conquer? What is there for Jesus to conquer? What is there for Jesus to conquer? In fact, he's the king of kings and he's the creator of the universe. And what is there for him to come? This is his. Even the earth is his. You and I have been created at least. What is there to come, Brother Rana? Yeah, it is uh, uh, overcoming death. Overcoming death. He has the keys to Hades. Okay. And so, in the first uh, phase or stage, and the message to Ephesus also is that he has the power to conquer death. And so, the white horse, the white, uh, uh, you know, that, that phase of Christian era represents, uh, you know, the, the victoriousness of Jesus Christ over death, which is a message to all men, which is, he alone has the power to conquer death. Nobody, no other philosophy, no other technology, nothing. So that is the message of uh, conquering. Uh, conquering, uh, of, well, which means uh, he has conquered death, Jesus conquered death. Okay, and that's one of the reason, okay, the, uh, what I was anticipating is this. What is there to conquer? You know, the whole world, even though it's Christ, even though it was created by him, somebody overtook him, right? Evil. Evil took over. Satan took over. You know the third temptation of Jesus Christ? What was the third temptation of Jesus Christ? The question. And he says something very powerful. Very strong. And he says, he takes up Jesus to the mountain and he shows the whole world. And he says, What is this? You see, everything is mine. Who said that? Everything is mine. I know where you come from. I want to do one thing. 
I give this to you. And then what happened? 
and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. What a contrast! Most probably, this is synonym, and this gives a prophetic message. And this helps us to look back behind the scene of what happened in the past and what could be able to repeatedly happen in the future. Listen to this part. Okay, the red, okay, color, okay, represents blood. Okay, you'll be able to see the writing has a sword. And what happens here? And it's allowed to take peace from the earth. Is that the way how it is supposed to? Because the Bible says, here I come to give you peace. Not the way of the world gives, but how God gives. The second scene describes the consequences of rejecting the gospel. <laughs> you see? The second scene represents rejecting the gospel. Okay? How? We will go a little bit further. Okay, beginning there. Okay, in the second century, as Christ is preaching spiritual warfare throughout the preaching of the gospel, the forces of evil render strong resistance, inevitably persecution followers. The writer does not uh, do the killing instead. He makes the peace from the earth as a result, persecution and inevitably follows. What happened in the second century? You and I are absolutely aware. There were a lot of bloodshed, right? From the time when Jesus was born. I forget about that Jesus was born. I remember the time when even when Moses was born. Forget okay, about even Moses' time. Even when you go back again to Arabic uh, explanation that you will be able to find what? Bloodshed. Our who, who was the first martyr? A beloved brother came. Became a murderer. Bloodshed. Again, coming back to the history. During the time of Moses, during the time of Egyptians, during the time of Babylon. You see, every time there was bloodshed, but in the book of Revelation, it talks about, okay, when the second scene was opened, it is not the writer who is killing, but he removes peace from the earth. Why? Why do you think so? Do you have any questions for that? Do you have any answers for that? I have a question, very can when I go through this lesson, why is that? You know, Satan is like a roaming like He doesn't want you or me to be a disciple of him or not. Why? Because he knows that anyone who believes Christ has eternal life. He's losing. Satan is losing the battle in every angle. Listen to this one, okay? Listen to this one. Persecution followed him. You know, the time if you met John the Baptist, what happened? He spoke the truth, and the, you know, the gospel was been able to spread. Uh, you know, Satan was absolutely very much wrong. And even the first part of the again after Jesus, uh, you know, okay, after Jesus was there, was John the Baptist. So the consequences, okay, for the sake of the gospel, and the disciples were killed, every disciple was killed in a different, different angle altogether, right? Because of the gospel. And Jesus says it absolutely very clear, I have not come here to give you peace, but what? The world. Why? Is a great controversy between okay, that is the okay meaning of this bloodshed everywhere there was chaos. And when you go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, and you'll be able to find the third seal there. Okay, what is what, 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 what does the Bible say? Okay, and it says, oh, verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 5. And when you have opened the third seal, I heard the third beast come and say, Come and see. And I behold and know what was the color of the horse? Black. A black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. My God. Number one is the white horse. Number two is the red horse. The second century. Okay, with a lot of bloodshed and things like that happening. And the third one is a black horse. In the black horse, you will be able to see a balance in his hand. That's what it means to say. The rider on the black horse holds a scale for weighing food. In those days, you know, their hearts. What did happen? If a person goes and learns what did happen, 
He simply says that he could be able to take care of the whole family for the day wages. But we go into a little bit further when there was famine, when there was pestilence, when there was difficulty. What happened? The daily wage would buy all the necessities for the family was absolutely gone. However, the famine would enormously inflate the normal price of food. In the scene of the third scene, it would take a whole day's work to buy just enough food for only one person. In order to feed a small family, a day's wage would be used to buy three quarters of a bucket. That's what it says. A cheaper course of food for the poor. The scene of the third scene points up to the further consequences of religion in the gospel, beginning in the fourth century as the church gained political power. If the white horse represents the preaching of the gospel, the black horse denotes the absence of the gospel and the reliance on human traditions. Grain in the Bible symbolizes the word of God. So rejecting the gospel inevitably results in the pattern of the word of God similar to the one prophesied by Amos. Because in the last days, the Bible says, in the last days you will not be able to be lacking food. But they will be hungry and thirsty for the word of God. What happened in the fourth century? Same thing happened, right? Bible was the old, truth was the old. Political favor was gained, and the truth was absolutely rejected. People started behaving the way how they want to. Every truth was cast to the ground. The church was pushed out to where? To the wilderness. Have you heard about it? Like us. No food. Even anyone who read the Bible was killed. Anyone who has the Bible killed. Bible was get absolutely put to the heaps and burned. Black hearts. Let's go a little bit further. Same Revelation chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. It says, And when he had, when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the Pope be saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, which horse? A pale horse, and his name that sat on him was what? Death and hell all over there. And powers were given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. My goodness. The color of the horse was what? Pale. Okay. And then? Which is an ashen gray color of the decomposing corpse. Symbolizes for that. And then it goes on to say this one. The rightest name is what? Death. That's what it says. Meanwhile, hates the place of the death accompanying him. These two are allowed to destroy the people by its word. That's what they got in Matthew chapter 27, too. Okay? And then but the good news is that the power of death and hate is very limited. Why? Because the power was given. It is not the power. You see, the person who has been able to sit on the pain was, you know, the power was given from whom? From God himself, most probably. But the power is limited. Death and hate, it might be. Famine, it might be pestilences, it might be whatever it is. What happens? Okay, it was limited. And then, Revelation chapter 1 was 18, there's a good news. What is the good news? Okay, the good news is that Jesus assures us that he has the keys of gates and death. That's what we read in Revelation chapter 1 was 18. And that's what Brother Hanni was talking about. Okay, we're talking about the first century. Victorious over death. You see? The beauty you hear is uh, the person who was victorious over sin, Satan, and death. That is Jesus Christ. The seeds of the seven seeds proclaims the future of the church, as was the case with the seven churches. The seed correlates to 
through the different periods of Christian history during the apostolic time, the gospel rapidly spread throughout the whole world. This expansion was followed by the period of persecution in the Roman Empire from the end of the first century to the beginning of the fourth century, as portrayed in the sea of the second sea and the third sea, also to the period of compromise of the fourth and the fifth century which was characterized by the spiritual famine caused by the lack of Bible and its truth, leading to the Dark Ages. The fourth sin aptly described the spiritual death that characterized Christianity for nearly a thousand long years. That's what we can say. I just want to find out the most practical part of spirituality of our lives today. Let's look back and take a little bit of history. When we really stand the beauty is, from the first century to the fourth century, we had what? Overcomers. I praise God for one thing. He was victorious over death and hates. Even though their power might be manifested now, sacrificing for the gospel, standing for the gospel, we want their brain to be dead. Just the way how Jesus was the resurrected from the dead. That should be the greatest hope. Let's go a little further before we be able to close, okay? And then uh, we will see how well, okay? Things will be able to get things done. Okay, just two minutes and then we'll be able to go. Okay, and the scene of the fourth scene, okay? The color of the house of the fourth scene is expressed with a Greek word, okay? Oh, fourth scene is all right. I'm sorry. Okay, and the fifth scene, okay, which is recorded in uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Uh, it says, and when he had opened the fifth sea, I saw under the altar the soul of them that was slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The question has been asked. The first part here, we write, which is recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The martyrdom of God's faithful and persecuted people is portrayed here in terms of sacrificial blood poured out at the base of the earthly sanctuary at the altar of sacrifice. The martyr saints were given the white robes representing their Christ righteousness. The beauty of the gospel here is recorded in verse 11. If you and I will be able to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of the gospel and Christ, listen to this beautiful statement. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and the brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. You see, white robes. Well, given, and I go to the white symbolizes what purity and righteousness. If you and I are being able to array ourselves to the gospel and Christ, then white robes will be given. I'll tell you what what what's going to happen. The robe that we have is absolutely very much adopted in every family. There's no option that we can be able to go out. And God is giving us an opportunity to Jesus Christ that that if you and I sacrifice ourselves for Christ and the gospel, it will not be vain. It will be glorious. That's what he says. And the seal of the fifth seal applies historically by the period leading up to the following the Reformation during which Britons were martyred because of their faithfulness. It also brings to mind the experience of God suffering people throughout history from the time of evil until the time when God will finally avenge the blood of his servant. The question is asked, when will we be able to avenge the blood? And the Bible is absolutely clear. The Lord is going to avenge. Last but not the least, we will be able to get into the opening of the sixth seal. And then we will be able to find that in post And I behold, uh, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black, a sandrock of hay, and the moon became as black. And the stars of heaven fell under the Lord, even as the fig tree casted that untimely figs, which is shaken of the mighty wind. And the heaven departed as the scroll, when it is rolled together and 
every mountain and island is working out of his place. Such was the power of God. Okay, what does the Bible say? When the sixth seal was absolutely open, and you are aware of every incident which is recorded in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. The sun was darkened, the moon, all of this were historical evidences that we have but from the Lord. Okay, I don't want to read, but I want to just mention a few. Okay, you know, the Christians in the Western world recognize the fulfillment of Jesus' words in the order of each of these three signs. The Lisbon earthquake in 1755, the dark day of May 1970 AD was experienced in eastern New York and the southern of New England. The spectacular meteoric showers over the Atlantic Ocean of November 13, 1833, the fulfillment of the prophecy in Revelation chapter 6 was started forty, led to the series of revival and to the realization of the second coming of Christ was absolutely very much near. And most probably this might happen again, we don't know. But what has happened in the history is to help us understand about the fulfillment of the prophecy is absolutely there. Or there. there is no one that you and I could be able to what? Escape when the prophecy of the word of the Lord has been able to fulfill and the Lord has the power to be able to fulfill that in the future too. And then the scene concludes with a rhetorical question by the terrorist wicked. The great day of the wrath has come and who is able to stand? And Revelation chapter 7 verse 4 says, those who will be able to stand in the day are the sealed people of God. Amen? And that's what the uh, brother was talking about when he talked about the seal of God. Who are the people who will be able to be sealed? And the people who will be able to be sealed are his children. Who are the ones who will be able to call his children? Are his disciples. Who are the ones who are the disciples? Who follow Jesus wherever he goes. And the Bible says it very clearly the Lord is my shepherd. I should not want. He leadeth me in the green pastures of still more. With the six seals, you and I should be able to understand the Lord is in control of the future. The Lord has predicted the future and He is in control of the future. The question comes around to each one of us. Whose side are you? One side there is persecution, death for the sake of gospel. On the other side we have the Lord who was victorious over death and hate as Give us the gospel of the good news for you and me. And that's the past experience of the seven churches, starting from the church of Ephesus in the Nova Asia. That God has given us an opportunity to make sure, looking at these matters, in prospect houses, and where is our life for the gospel as we do. But ultimately, the Bible says, only the overcomers will have an opportunity to be victorious over them. So let's hear answers for our Lord Savior Jesus Christ who has all the power and another one day. Even though we are suffering persecuted for a little while, you and I have to have an opportunity to be able to be able to do this over and sin and sin. Any questions to me? Any questions? Things are fine? And thank God for it. Okay? The Lord will work that is being able to do us. At this time, yes sir. Yeah, I think uh, this bears mentioning, you, you just read it. The sixth seal represents, uh, I think it's the fifth seal, right? Uh, that represents the Reformation time. When yes, seal. absolutely. Yeah. And the sixth seal represents, I think, uh, the time when, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Roman Catholic Church's ascendancy. Uh, absolutely. That's what I told you, the history is going to repeat and it's going to happen the same thing. Right. What happened in the first century to the last. Okay, and then uh, again the persecution, everything will start up in a very, very vehement way. Yes. Yeah, and the common uh, word that is used nowadays is called collusion. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So uh -huh. there will be collusion, uh -huh. or collaboration uh -huh. between the forces of the earth, so to speak, the new forces, or you know, the earthly forces, mm -hmm. and the religious mm -hmm. side. Of it. That means you will see that many will be uh, 
uh, many will be drawn to collaborate with earthly forces to have to accomplish heavenly goals. Will it happen? No. It will never happen. I would say that when you deal with the devil, you get the devil with the deal. <laughs> yeah. The goal of the devil is not to further heavenly goals, but rather use half truth and half error to further its own goals, which is death and destruction. Yeah, absolutely. To keep as many as possible from going to heaven. Yes, absolutely. There are and so many uh, Christians will be motivated, or whether it is because of ignorance or uh, or stubbornness, whatever. To collaborate with, uh, you know, uh, earthly powers to accomplish heavenly goals, it will never happen. Because many think that just like God used Rahab, uh, God used Rahab, or rather uh, Rahab the harlot, uh, to have the spies to, you know, yeah. to, to like, uh, Therefore, they, they feel like you know God will use evil forces to accomplish His purposes. Is that true? Can it happen? And that's a question many people will be, unfortunately, is, uh, you know, uh, I would say, lost over. Uh -huh. When God used Rahab, Rahab also, even though she was a harlot, she changed her ways. Mm -hmm. She did not continue to be a harlot. Mm -hmm. In fact, she said that, uh, you know, since I helped you, please remember me and my family when you conquer this land. Mm -hmm. Which means it had to be her who changed her ways as well. So many people will be thinking that somehow collaborating with uh, uh, you know uh, forces or people that are not necessarily you know saints will accomplish or further God's kingdom. And we should be aware that you know that will never happen. Uh, if I'm mistaken, you can correct me. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. God uses you know people who are evil also or bad. Yeah, absolutely. I, I but at the same you. time, we have to first think about depending on God alone to accomplish His purposes, uh -huh. and not drawn into you know uh, what should I say, order or you know that's what Babylon is all about. The wine of the wrath of God is poured on those who collaborate uh, with earthly forces, so to speak. To force other people to follow their own religious objectives. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the contribution and uh, uh, God bless each one of us as we contemplate on this and uh, we will have our offering being collected and after which we will be able to have a small break and take our five minutes. Okay. Thank you for sustaining the front forward.